take your outline and take your Bibles and turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Some of you are old enough to remember the detergent called Does. How many of you remember Does? Does does it all. Back in the 50s, uh, Does started out as a laundry detergent. Then in the 60s, it also became known as a dishwasher detergent. Well, during that time, there was a young boy who saw a commercial for Does. He got all excited. He went to the local grocery store, and he asked for a box of Does. And the grocer looked at him. He said, this kid's awfully young. I wonder why he wants this stuff. And so he asked him, and the boy said, I want to give my cat a bath. Well, the grocer responded, he said, young man, you really shouldn't wash your cat with this kind of soap. But the boy insisted, he bought the soap, and then a few days later, he was back at the grocery store again. And so the owner said, well, how's your cat? And the young boy replied, he died. And so the, the grocer said to him, he said, I told you not to wash your cat in that detergent. The boy replied, the soap didn't hurt him a bit. It was the spin cycle that got him. <laughs> now today, you might feel like that cat, that you are caught up in the spin cycle, and you've been tossed around so many times and ways, you don't know which end is up, and, and you wonder if you're even going to survive like that cat. It seems hard for you to imagine that you might be able to once again stand up secure, stable, ready to move on in life with hope. That's exactly what God wants for us. God has given us a solid foundation in Christ Jesus upon which we can stand. And he intends for us, no matter what kind of uncertainty comes our way, that we will be able to stand firm. To stand firm. That based on the history that we have with God, we can stand firm on Christ in the future. And so that's what we want to look at today in this chapter of 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. It begins, Paul, Savanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians, in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The first thing we want to see in our passage today is that they remind us of a few things. First of all, that we are not alone. We are not alone. Paul himself had to remind himself that he was not alone. Oftentimes he would start his letters, Paul, an apostle of Christ. In several letters he says, Paul and Timothy. But here in 1 Thessalonians and also 2 Thessalonians, both times they address it, Paul, Sabanus, or Silas, and Timothy. There are three of them. They are a team. They are doing this together. I know for me, part of my struggle the last few months has been that feeling at times that I was all by myself, that everyone is out there doing their own thing, secluded by themselves, and here I am stuck in my own head with no one except my poor wife to share my thoughts and feelings and everything else going on. It seemed like no one else was on the same page or wavelength. But that, of course, was a feeling. It wasn't a fact. But I think a lot of people have felt that way the last few months. We are not alone, Paul reminds us. Secondly, they remind us who we are. We are the church, Christ church, in this place. Whereas the church is not a building, not a place, but a people, we are his church in this place. He has us here for a reason, and as the church, we are a part of God's family. He is our father, and we are his children. He takes care of us as a loving father, always has, always will. He says also here, we are under the lordship of Jesus Christ. He is our king. We are a part of his kingdom. So we are not these little hermits hiding out in our little corners of the world. We are gathered together as God's family under the lordship of Jesus Christ. We have connection. We have support. We are together and not alone. We're family and God's people. 
Thirdly, they remind us what God has given to us. What he has given to us. Though he poses it here as a blessing, actually it is a reminder to us as well of those two special gifts that God has given to us as his family, as his children, as his people. And that is grace and peace. And we need to be reminded constantly what those are. Grace is that God-given ability to do what we cannot do on our own. And that includes not only our salvation, but it includes being able to live a life that matters, a life that pleases God. It also includes a strength that is beyond our own means when we've come to the end of ourselves. Peace is that tranquility of spirit that will calm us, even like we feel that we are stuck in the spin cycle. A calmness that knows all will be well, that God is still in control, even as life around us seems to be out of control. As Paul usually did in keeping with form and structure, he transitions into the next part of his letter in verses 3 and 4, this time of thanksgiving. He says, we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, as is right, because your faith is growing abundantly and the love of every one of you for one another is increasing. Therefore, we ourselves boast about you in the churches of God for your steadfastness and faith in all your persecutions and in the afflictions that you are enduring. These three co-workers in Christ remark about the progress that the Thessalonians have made since their last letter. First Thessalonians had been written less than a year before this, most Bible scholars believe, and yet they st still hear that these people are growing in their faith. He says, we ought to be giving God thanks about you. And the idea is we are bound it's only right. It's an obligation we have. We need to do this. We are compelled to give thanks to God when we think about you. We need to realize that these three had invested greatly in the church at Thessalonica. That all three of them were on the missionary team that had gone there on Paul's second missionary journey. And they preached, they shared, they suffered persecution. And they stayed there a while to establish them in their faith. They planted and established that church. So they had a vested interest. So when they say here, you know, we have to. We are obligated. We have to give thanks. And we have to give thanks about a few things. First of all, he says that your faith is growing abundantly. And this word growing is used only here in the New Testament. And it's one of those hyper words. That, that Greek prefix hyper means super. You are super growing in your faith. Sometimes we remark about a young follower of Christ, how quickly that person seems to grow in their faith. Where a time of revival comes and, and people really seem to be responding and changing their lives drastically and radically and quickly. That truly is what God would like to see for each and every one of us in each and every church is that we would remain super growing in our faith. The word also used is flourishing. When you think about a garden or things that grow like that, flourishing, just overwhelming growth. Secondly, he says, we're thankful that each and every one of you seems to love at an ever increasing rate. The construction here really is emphatic. Each and every one of you, he says, is finding more ways to love each other. They were outdoing themselves to find ways to do what was best for someone else, regardless the cost to themselves. And it wasn't just an isolated case here and there. He says, every time I turn around, everywhere I look, everyone I hear report about you keeps telling us the same thing. That there are these stories of amazing love being demonstrated by believers to each other in your congregation. Thirdly, he says, we're thankful that your enduring hope has continued through the midst of persecution and hostility. 
In verse 4, Paul and his friends say, we boast about you. And, and this is another word only used here in the New Testament. It's, it's like saying, we are so proud of you. Pride is, is often a bad thing, but sometimes it's a good thing. We are so proud of you, like the, the pride of parents. We are so proud of your hope. Now, we know that Paul often did speak highly of one church when addressing another to try to encourage and challenge the others. In 2 Corinthians 8, he told the Corinthians... He says, we want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints and this not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. He talks here about the churches of Macedonia. Thessalonica was one of those churches that Paul is bragging about here. He says, we're bragging about them because even though they were persecuted and they were poor, they found a way. To give an offering to help these starving believers in Jerusalem and Judea. That we, he said, they've lived out their faith and their hope and their love in a very practical way. He says, so we've been bragging about you. Like proud parents. He says, you've also shown hope by your steadfastness. And this is our word to stand firm. He said, you have stood firm. You have remained under. And the picture here is of when some weight is being pushed down upon you. That rather than running away and trying to escape it, you stand there firmly pushing back. You stand firm underneath that pressure. These believers were steadfast. They were standing. They were remaining under persecution and pressure. That word tribulation we've seen before has to do with this kind of pushing down pressure of affliction. Now I said at the beginning of this section that Paul and his two friends were saying that these things that they are seeing and reporting about and giving thanks about were answered prayer. They were answered prayer. If you mark your page here and just turn back a few pages to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Just a couple pages back here in your Bible. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and the beginning there at verse 2 it says, We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope. Those three things that we just talked about here. In our Lord Jesus Christ. But Paul and his comrades weren't being redundant here. They're not just saying the same thing over again. In this introduction to 2 Thessalonians. As we look to chapter 3 of 1 Thessalonians. He mentions it again. At least one of them. 1 Thessalonians 3.11. He says, now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all as we do for you. In other words, he had told them in 1 Thessalonians, that first letter he wrote less than a year before, he says, we are praying for you that you will continue to grow in your faith, love, and hope. You've been doing a great job, but we are praying that you will do even better than these things. Now, as we look at these things, faith, love, and hope, we want to go back to 2 Thessalonians 1 and verses 3 and 4. 2 Thessalonians 1, 3 and 4, and ask this question, which one of those words is missing? Which one of those words is missing in those verses, faith, love, or hope? 
Though I mentioned here in my outline about their enduring hope in the midst of post-persecution, you do not find that word hope in verses 3 and 4. And that's on purpose on Paul's part. Because if there were any of the three areas that this church needed to excel more in, it was hope. And so he mentions here, you know, their increasing faith and their increasing love, but he does not say you're increasing hope. He rather kind of skirts around it and describes a little bit about being hopeful. But the, the insinuation is you need to be hoping more in the midst of your struggles and your tribulations. And so as we move into the rest of the chapter, that's what he wants to talk to us about here. And actually throughout the rest of the letter, these three servants want to talk to us about having a greater hope, about standing firm in our hope. So let's pick back up at verse 5. He says, this is evidence of the righteous judgment of God that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are also suffering. Since indeed God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us. When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. When he comes on that day to be glorified with his saints and to be marveled at among all who have believed because our testimony to you was believed. To this end, we always pray for you that our God may make you worthy of his calling and may fulfill every resolve for good and every work of faith by his power. So that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. We find in this final section of our passage today that they request God's comfort and encouragement for this church, for this body of believers. They say, we want you to know. That God is watching over you. That God is going to be with you. He's going to comfort you. He's going to encourage you. He is going to give you a hope for the future. And so he begins this paragraph with a very interesting thought. A very interesting word. This word evidence. Evidence. What evidence? Well, if we think about the flow, we have to go right back to verse 4. The preceding statement where he is talking about persecutions and afflictions. He says the evidence that is presented here are your persecutions and afflictions. Again, this is a term that's only used here in the New Testament. Evidence is a sure token of God's righteous judgment. Going through these struggles and these afflictions and these persecutions is a sure sign that we are in the right place. That we are in a relationship with the true and living God. John MacArthur says it this way. He says it is positive proof that God was in the process of purging, purifying, and perfecting his people. He loves alliteration just as much as I do. Okay, positive proof that God was in the process of purging, purifying, and perfecting his people. Now, that wasn't just Paul's theology. Remember, we have three writers here. And they are all in agreement that this is what we believe as the early church. And we find similar statements from the other gospel and letter writers. James. James chapter 1 says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. We've seen that word before here in our passage. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. What was lacking in them at that time was this hope, this endurance, this steadfastness. And then as we look at 1 Peter 5, another well-known passage. And after you've suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish 
u. Now, that's not the way we usually approach persecution and suffering and afflictions, is it? We look at suffering and persecutions and tribulations rather as an intrusion into our personal comfort and happiness and fulfillment in this life. A totally different approach than what we're accustomed to. But that was the approach of the early church. The term that is used here for judgment is also very interesting. It's the Greek word chrysis. And it's used for the righteous judgment of God, especially the righteous judgment of his Messiah. And so the picture presented here is that evidence is being presented before the judge. And justice is being served. And we think, well, what does all this have to do with persecution and affliction that we are going through now? How does that relate to judgment? Well, it's very interesting if we look at that word, that Greek word, chrysis, we often get our English words by transliterating Greek words like crisis. That the present crisis that we have in our life here and now is something that looks forward as well to the future judgment that is to come. That our crisis now is connected to judgment that will take place in the future. It shows something about who we are that we are going through the crisis now. He says we are considered worthy to suffer. Why are we considered worthy to suffer? He says... Because it shows our concern for the kingdom above our own comfort. That our perspective, if we are people of hope, is not going to be so much for our comfort, for our happiness, for our fulfillment, but that we are going to be more concerned about the kingdom of God. We need hope for the future to help us through the crisis now. Realizing what will someday take place at the judgment. And so in verses 6 and 7, he goes on and he talks more about this justice and this judgment of God. Because it relates to God's character. He says, God considers. And the idea of consider here is to estimate. God sees things this way. He says we need to step back and think about how God views all of this. How he views our crises. And how he is viewing judgment. This trio of writers wants us to have God's perspective. To see things as he sees them. And what he's planning to do. God repays afflictions with retribution and relief. When God looks and he sees that his people are being afflicted, that they are, they are being persecuted, he says his plan is to pay back those who have persecuted his saints with retribution and punishment. While those who have been persecuted, he said, will find relief, is the word used here in the ESV, a renewal, a rest, a refreshing. The picture here is very similar to what we find in Luke 16 when Jesus was telling the story about the rich man and Lazarus. And so we're going to look there now at a longer paragraph of this passage. Luke 16, beginning at verse 19. Very familiar story. Maybe you've been a while since you heard it. There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried, and in Hades, being in torment, 
he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things and Lazarus in like manner bad things, but now he is comforted here and you are in anguish. Besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able and none may cross from here, there to us. The picture that Paul paints for us here in 2 Thessalonians 1 is that those who did the afflicting will become the afflicted, much like the rich man became the suffering beggar. But this is not a role reversal. The persecuted do not become the persecutors. The persecuted do not become the persecutors. That is not justice. See, only God is the rightful judge. He takes care of things, as we said last week. It's not up to us to do that. He takes care of being judge. Paul talks about this also in Romans 8, 18, when we think about suffering and persecution for our faith. He says, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. He says, this is the perspective that, that God wants us to have about Persecution, suffering, trials that we go through in this life. He says they are going to quickly fade in comparison to the glory that we will behold. He says when we enter into glory, we're not going to be worrying about getting revenge. It's going to be the farthest thing from our minds, the suffering that we had. When Christ returns, memory of that suffering is going to be disappearing. Think about the picture with Lazarus. When Lazarus was there in um, Abraham's bosom, as it's called, in the place of care and restoration, he had no thought about the rich man and how the rich man had ignored him in this life. He could not see him. He had no, no thoughts about the old life and all the suffering that he went through. Glory is that great, Paul says, that all of those things are going to be gone away. All those tears will be gone. All the suffering will be gone. Lazarus was not there reveling and looking at the destruction of the rich man. He was not thriving on the fact that the rich man was finally getting his. See, it's not about revenge. It's about God's justice. About God being the holy and righteous one who does what is right. He judges his way in his time for his reason. Notice also here the mention of the angels of his might. These are the angels that throughout the Old Testament show up whenever God shows up in judgment. Here they are called Jesus angels. And we see the Father and the Son on the same page. They are equally God. Angels come at the Son's revealing, his return in judgment. It's what Jesus talked about in Matthew 25. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne of judgment. Also occurring with this coming in judgment is this flaming fire. In verse 8. Fire was a long-standing picture in the Old Testament of the coming judgment. A sign that God is going to come and to judge 
Isaiah 66, verse 15 says this, For behold, the Lord will come in fire, and His chariots like the whirlwind, to render His anger in fury and His rebuke with flames of fire. For by fire will the Lord enter into judgment, and by His sword with all flesh, and those slain by the Lord shall be many. The Lord is going to be, bring this great judgment against the wicked. Why? Was it simply because they had persecuted God's people? No, it's something far deeper, Paul says. As we look here at verse 8 in 2 Thessalonians 1, it was because, first, they do not know God, and secondly, because they do not obey the gospel. This is a parallel statement. John 17 says that eternal life is knowing God, having a relationship with Him. And the call of the gospel is to believe, have faith, trust in Jesus Christ as our Savior and Redeemer. Romans 1 tells us that most people choose to not know God. That knowing God is a choice. They choose to not know God. And Romans chapter 10 tells us that many disobey by not believing the gospel. Refusing to accept Christ. So it runs deeper than just the persecution of God's people. Persecution is just one of the many symptoms of people's rebellion against God. And that is what will be judged by Christ. Verse 9 says that they will suffer eternal destruction. Now, can you wrap your head around that? Doesn't that sound like an oxymoron? Eternal destruction. How can something be destroyed but continue to go on? In my simplistic mind, think about two young kids sitting on the floor, and one of them is playing with blocks. And he's, he's building this nice stack of blocks. And it's just getting real high and, and almost as tall as he is. And what's the other kid do? Pfft, knocks it down. So the other one starts building again. Pfft, knocks it down. Over and over again, this goes on and on and on. And, and the builder is getting frustrated and going through this anguish. Just wants to build this building and can't do it. Because no one steps in to give justice. In hell, there is no God to intervene and give justice. The destruction is total. It keeps getting knocked down over and over again, but it does so without end. It's the opposite of eternal life. Eternal life is knowing God and being in His presence. Eternal destruction is where there is no presence of God and there is no hope for anything to change. That's the last phrase here of verse 9. Away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His might. He's saying that in the place of eternal destruction, God will not be there to see the injustice, to step in and to do something about it. But those of us who have hope in Christ, everything's altogether different. God will be there. He will step in. He will bring about justice and make things right. And that's the, the picture as we move into verse 10. When Christ comes, first of all, he will be glorified in his saints. Paul says in Ephesians 2.10 that we are his workmanship. We are a work in progress. We are something that he is preparing that he can show off. Christ is going to come and he's going to be excited, we are told, to take his bride home. It is the next step in his purpose, his glory, to come back for his church, for his people. Secondly, secondly, 
when Christ comes, what will be the response of his saints? He will be marveled at by believers. He will be marveled at by believers. It's the opposite of those who are opposed to the gospel, disobey the gospel, do not believe in Christ. Those that rejected him looked at him and said, no. Refused to believe, refused to trust him. But the bride of Christ, when Christ comes back, is going to look at her knight in shining armor and say, he actually came back for me like he said he would. Totally different perspective. Notice who else is going to be there. This trio who testified to the truth. Paul and Silas and Timothy, they're going to be there as well. He said, we're going to be celebrating with you. We didn't bring it out back in verse 7, but the same thing is seen back there. Where they say, this is going to be a time that we will find relief too, together. He says, we, the missionary band, and you, the church, you are going to all rejoice together. When Christ comes again. All of this brings these missionaries back to pray again. In verses 11 and 12. It's a prayer with a very particular purpose. He says, so what we're doing now. As we think about you and your need for hope. In the midst of your struggles and trials. He says, we're praying that God would make you worthy. You are worthy. We're praying that God will make you more worthy. That our lives will be consistent with our call as Christ followers. That we will have a hope that makes a difference in how we live. As we look at the other passages that use this idea of walking worthy. We get an idea of what that looks like. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, he says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. He says, walking worthy means having that visible fruit of the Spirit work its way out. And how we deal with one another in the body of Christ. There is a very real sense in which we cannot walk worthy if we are not together with one another. That's how we work out our salvation. As we relate to one another, especially as with other believers. That we demonstrate these quality characteristics, these fruit of the Spirit. And this humility and gentleness and patience and forgiveness. Another passage that he talks about walking worthy is Colossians in his prayer for the Colossians. He says, we are praying so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy. Giving thanks to to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He says a worthy walk is enduring, patient, and joyful. Even in the midst of struggles and uncertainties. Endurance is like a rechargeable battery. For those of you who care to read instructions, all right, ladies, um, for any of us, you get a new electronic device like a phone or something like that, what do they tell you to do? Use it till it dies. First few times, use it till it dies. Why? Because that develops the battery so that it can receive and hold the charge better and last longer. That's the picture here of what happens when trials and sufferings and crises come into our lives. They empty us. 
They take everything we've got and more. And that's exactly the point. Endurance is when we open our lives up and say, okay, I am at the end of myself. I am willing to go through whatever you want me to, God, but I need you. I need your power. I need your grace. I need your strength. And when these things come our way, these three writers, and as we saw James and Peter, when these sufferings come our way that just take every ounce of strength out of us, what that does is it gives us a greater capacity to receive his power and strength for what we need. The second purpose of this prayer is that it will fulfill every resolve for the good, for good and every work of faith. This is another parallel statement, two ways of saying the same thing. If the second line adds anything, it's this, that is the actions that go with the attitudes. He says we have to have this attitude and this action, this prayer that, that God is going to do good things through us. He says, that's what I'm praying. That's what we are praying for you, is God is going to do something good through you. And he's going to do something good through you, not because you're so good, but because you are a willing vessel, that you want God to do something through you. That you are willing to say, okay, God, take me and do something through me, even though I feel like I'm going through the spin cycle. Even though I feel like I've gone through the old ringer washer. That our desire will be so much to be used by God through his grace, power, and strength. That we're willing to allow him to take and do something good through us. And so in verse 12, the ultimate goal of this is that the name of Christ may be glorified. That his reputation will be exalted. That he's given the credit for any good that takes place. And that his grace will be seen in us. My favorite commentator, F.F. F. Bruce, calls this whole picture here the ethics of eschatology. That whenever we look at the end of things, the end of time, and what, what God is going to do, we need to think about what that has to do with here and now. And Paul says, what is going to take place is at the end of time, God is going to be glorified. And so if that is what is going to happen, then that's what we need to do all we can to make happen here and now. He says, we are not only to patiently endure, Hope is not only patiently enduring whatever suffering and struggles we need to go through in this life, but it is to positively act. That a life of hope in Jesus says, if he's going to be glorified at his coming again, then I am going to do anything I can now to glorify him in this life. We need to stand firm in hope. The hope of eternity and every tomorrow. Heavenly Father, we come to you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the presence of your Holy Spirit to work with your word. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for those glimpses you do give us of when you are at work. When we see someone come to faith in Christ, when we see acts of love of brothers and sisters for one another. And Lord, when we get a glimpse, when we get a glimpse of what lies before us and what that means about what you want us to be doing here and now, we pray, Heavenly Father, that you have given us a glimmer of hope today, maybe even a, a bright ray of sunshine of hope as we look forward to Christ's return as well as looking forward to every tomorrow. It's in his name that we pray. Amen.